part four of The Color Yellow. Samantha seemed to be vibrant and blonde, but both of those things could easily be faked. She had to be in her 30s, but she had the classic good looks of a movie starlet that transcended time. Malcolm almost stood up to switch cars and leave. His urge to feed was becoming as crippling as someone holding in their pee. Samantha kept talking every time he fidgeted as if to leave. There was a man in a long coat sleeping on the window passed out before the train even started. Samantha looked at her expensive watch as if she were waiting for something. Do you have any hobbies, Malcolm? Malcolm's boredom began to feel like an anchor dragging him down. The job usually keeps me pretty busy, but I do like film when I can. I haven't been to the movies in two years. No, I like making movies. Samantha snapped her fingers briskly, and the man who was passed out sleep stirred awake. Get my camera. The man, if it was a man, Malcolm couldn't tell from the angle he found himself, reached into an overhead compartment and pulled down a huge steamer trunk. Malcolm was almost certain they were going to have to check that. The man faced the opening of the chest away from himself and came up with a video camera from the early 90s. Malcolm was honestly intrigued now. The cloaked man handed Samantha this device. You look like a man that's not sure of what he wants in life. A bit presumptuous, aren't we? Malcolm said with a dab of anger. That's fine. I was like that too until I truly looked inside and found myself. Malcolm started to worry that he was about to have to sit through a long and boring talk about Jesus. You've done wrong, haven't you? Sure, Malcolm said with raising annoyance. Not just a little, but a lot. What if I told you I could end it for you? Alright, I have to go, Malcolm said with a polite smile. No, please wait. Just look at the tape. It's less than a minute. And we'll leave. Malcolm threw up his hands in defeat. Yeah, okay, whatever. Samantha pushed play on the ancient device. It set the mood. There was a warehouse with a man sitting tied to a chair. Malcolm completely pivoted on the idea of religious people to some sort of sexual deviance. He was instantly intrigued again. The small image in the window progressed and Samantha was standing in front of the man. Any last words to share before you die? She said to the man in the seat. Spare the rest of them, was all he uttered. Samantha laughed hard. Since it's your final words, why not? It sounded like a lie and he and she both knew it. Malcolm vaguely recognized the voice but it all became clear in the next moment. Coming from outside of the camera's view was a creature that was the color yellow. It was part man, part something else. It had misshapen wings of reptilian texture. It had teeth and claws like an animal, but no hair. What it was exactly was hard to describe to his own brain. The yellow beast clawed and violently tore chunks away from the men, while Samantha watched with a barely contained grin. Malcolm dispelled all notions this was fake when he realized it was the voice of the man he met the night before. He darted to the sliding door, but a huge clawed yellow hand grabbed his arm and flung him onto the window. The glass rattled, cracked, and nearly shattered. Through the explosiveness of the gesture, the man's hood shook loose and the yellow beast from the snuff film was before him. Samantha casually went into her huge steamer trunk and retrieved a tripod and a blank VHS tape which was still in the package. Malcolm tried to wriggle free, but he was much too weak to make much of a difference. Any last words, she asked Malcolm while ripping the tape from the plastic and putting it into the camera. Malcolm pursed his lips to talk, but Samantha put up a single finger as if to say, hold on a moment. All right, do you have any last words? Malcolm looked to Samantha as if unsure if he should talk. You're fine, go, 
she said quickly with no emotion other than morbid excitement. Why? Malcolm eked out. Samantha took a brief look at her watch. We got three minutes before we take off and I'll be damned if I'm going to fucking Detroit. So I'll give you the quick version before I paint your guts on the cabin walls. You ever heard of H.H. Holmes? Malcolm shook his head negatively. H.H. Holmes, the biggest serial killer in Chicago? What do they even teach you kids in school? Samantha said with disgust. Lady, I was a teenage dropout, so history lessons are lost on me, Malcolm said while the yellow beast clutched his neck with a misshapen clawed arm that structure defied classification. Well, you can die ignorant if you like, doesn't matter to me, so long as you die. I've devoted my life to ridding the world of your lot. I used to have to do this by carefully planning until I lured one of you. That is, until I found my angel, Samantha said while rubbing the misshapen beast's back. Samantha looked at her watch one last time, but this time her gaze lingered. Finish him, she commanded the yellow beast. Malcolm's eyes widened when the creature's gnarled teeth opened to rend him to oblivion. Samantha sat behind her camera like a sadistic god destined to revel in mortal pain. After the first tear into the neck, Malcolm's flesh flew in chunks. He screamed so loud you wouldn't have believed he was looking to kill himself hours before. Suddenly, the window of the train shattered and Malcolm was violently pulled through like a stubborn tooth. There was a brief moment that the light of the train platform shone in and the serrated hunting knife came through and stabbed the yellow creature in its heart. Samantha yelled, but didn't let that slow her reaction time. Samantha grabbed her camera from the tripod and dashed through the train car. Malcolm housed a slew of crisscrossing scars, most from where he was drugged through the glass. Roger from the mission cradled him like a newborn, while Yusuf tore his knife from the beast's chest, ripping out just as much gore going in as out. Yusuf took only a moment to see if the beast would get up before jumping over the huge steamer chest and chasing down Samantha. What happened? Malcolm asked from death's door. We wanted to see you out of town just in case, Roger said while poking himself with a needle extracting blood like a mosquito. He took off the stopper and dribbled the blood into Malcolm's mouth. He felt much better, as if he were given the elixir of life, but he wasn't yet right. And from this exchange, he may never be again. Roger hopped in the train car and easily threw the heavy beast corpse into the steamer trunk, which he hoisted onto his shoulder as if it had no weight. When the trunk shut, so was the threat of the creature, like a bow placed on top of a Christmas present. Yusef was at the end of the platform, which was now pooling with onlookers like a bloody wound, and shrugged as if the woman had eluded him. Roger nodded to him to hightail it out of there, and that gesture was easily understood and translated. Yusef blended into the crowd and slipped away. Malcolm asked Roger, who led him through the underbelly of the train like a fugitive slave, What are we doing? What we do every night, survive until the next one. I can't make heads or tails of this. On one hand, emo nerds. On other hand, survivors. And, in some cases, victims. I do not like that vampires find ways to avoid my bone pile. But, hmm, there's just so many versions of Night Stalkers. Who knows what the quintessential, canonical version of a vampire is. Huh. I guess the only right thing to do is keep this conversation open. It wouldn't be right to just brand them emo nerds and then just walk away from it. I still have work to do, children, so night night.